So Jeffrey, Dina, thank you both for being here. As both of you know, of course, today is the day. For, it's the first time ever that a former or current president is sitting trial in a criminal proceeding at issue is whether the former president, Donald Trump, his alleged hush money payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels is an attempt to hide sexual encounters between the two. And I want to get right to it. Thank you both for joining us. Um, listen, it, this, is, this is a, what is called voir dire, what happened Indeed. today. So what does this mean? Because previously, the former president had sought to postpone this, his legal team, saying that he could not get a jury that was impartial uh, here in, um, in Manhattan or in New York. Did you buy that argument, Jeffrey? I, I did not, and I, I have covered many high-profile trials, and we journalists always make a mistake. We think that everyone follows the news as closely as we do. True. And we think, well, everybody knows everything about this trial, so there's no way you can get an, a, a fair jury. Not true. People certainly have a vague awareness of this trial. They know who Donald Trump is. But I don't think they are going to have a big problem getting people to say and believe that, look, I'm vaguely familiar with the, the broader array of allegations, but I'll be fair. And I think they will get a jury, and it won't even take that long. Dina, do you agree? I mean, this is why they have a lot more jurors show up than in a typical trial, because you're going to have to weed out a lot of people who have an opinion on the case and aren't willing to set it aside. But that's what they allow for by having so many more, and they whittle it down. And we've seen it. I mean, we see with O.J. Simpson's passing, you know, he got an acquittal despite the huge amount of publicity. Kyle Rittenhouse, same thing, acquittal despite the it being cameras in the courtroom. So we know how to do that in this system, and they account for that by having a lot more jurors. So well, and also the questionnaire is very interesting. What is it, 47 questions or 42 it's, questions? Uh, it's in, that, it's questions, in that ballpark. Yeah. But one thing the judge said is we are not asking people, are you Democrat or Republican? We're not asking them, did you vote for Trump? But they ask a lot of questions did that are sort of proxies. Yeah. Did you go to a rally? Do you watch Fox News? Do you watch MSNBC? Do, are, do you know, do you, are you a member of the three percenters? Are you a member of Antifa? All of these questions are designed to tease out bias but allowing people a measure of privacy on their actual voting habits. How do you think this is going to go, Dina, and how long do you think it's going to go? I mean, it will go a few days, and it really does depend on the judge. Some of them allow for a lot more leeway. Um, I would think by the end of this week, maybe we'll have one, if not into next week. But one thing to keep in mind is that the defense throughout this trial is going to try to portray this as an out-of-control process that can't give Trump a fair trial. Yeah. So they are going to try to stretch out the uh, jury selection process as long as possible and allege that every juror is biased in some way that um, I, I think will we'll, we'll make it slower than it, than it should be. But Judge Marshawn, from what I understand, is someone who can keep control and is will will get a jury in this case. Don't you think it might be an easier process here, considering the kinds of questions that Jeffrey talked to, that you mentioned here, that it might be an easier process in New York to find a, an impartial juror than maybe in the rest of the country that tends to be more red? Well, it, it depends what you mean by impartial. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think it. You know, frankly, I think Trump is in trouble with this jury pool. Manhattan is overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh -huh. Um, the, the 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 voting patterns. I mean, it's it's hard to find. They know Trump him voting. better than people around the country. Well, from it, the, previously, from before he was president. Correct. I mean, he's been a celebrity here for for decades. But also, just on a sh purely political basis, Manhattan is a very blue district, yeah. and you know, the, this part of Manhattan is even more liberal than other parts of. This part of New York City is more liberal than other parts of the city. So that's a problem for Trump, no question about that. Does that make it harder, you think, Dina, here? Or I, I think it might make it easier because people here, as I said, they may not be biased, as biased as you know, people in the middle of the country because the red states really love Trump. It, it's true. And, and to the point about, you know, we, the jury is going to be anonymous to us. 
but not to the parties. So his attorneys will know their addresses. They'll know if he they live on the Upper East Side, Trump may be more likely to want them because he might think they're more conservative. They're gonna have so much more information. And even the questionnaires, if they will be able to look at their social media to see if they even accurately answered those questions about, did they go to rallies? Have they been supporting him? And so they, I think that's important for kind of us all to know too. It's not like they just have to take the person's word for it. They Lawyers typically in these kind of situations do a little bit of diligence to see, and social media is a great way to check out whether or not those jurors are being truthful or not in well, court. Let's talk about the evidence and the witnesses because Stormy Daniels is going to take the stand, right? It looks that way. And Michael Cohen as well. Michael Cohen is the key witness in the case. So then how do you, so how does this legal, how, how would the legal team, how are they going to cross-examine or examine um, the person who actually paid the money? I think it was his suggestion to to pay the money. Well, he, he the, the money went from Michael Cohen's own pocket to Stormy Daniels, and then Trump reimbursed uh, Michael. Michael. And, and the issue in the case, the legal issue in the case, is those reimbursements to Michael Cohn uh, are alleged to be fabricated on Trump's um, uh, corporate documents. He treated them as um, legal expenses, mm -hmm. as legal fees to Michael Cohn, when in fact they were payments to Stormy Daniels. Okay, so. I, I'm going to get to that. Hold, okay. hold tight, because I, I just want to ask you: Do you think? How do you think they're going to handle uh, Michael Cohen, um, Dina, it, when he is on the witness stand? Is that is that going to be tough for the Trump lawyers? I mean, we kind of know what they're going to say. They're going to say that he's so you know he's he's very vocal right in his opinion about Trump and they're definitely going to use that against him they're going to say he has some sort of axe to grind against his old boss but the problem is is that he actually served time for his involvement in this scheme right. and that is a really hard thing to get around in front of the jury it, you know, in Trump's words, he always thinks things need to be fair. Well, it certainly seems unfair when half of the parties who were involved has already served time, and now you're trying to say you shouldn't. Um, so it's going to be tricky for the Trump lawyers, but we'll but, see them try to say that he just is, uh, he has this axe to grind, and we'll hear that, and that he's not credible over and over. But but that f serving time is a problem for the prosecution as well, because among the things he served time for were making false statements right. under oath. Right. Why should the jury believe you, the defense will argue, when you've already been convicted of, of lying? When you acknowledge, as, he's, as he has acknowledged, that he lied to the judge even when he was pleading guilty in mm -hmm. federal court. I mean, he is a definite problematic witness. Now, the good thing that the prosecution has is the documents. They have the checks themselves. Those, ca you can't cross-examine the checks. And that's a big problem for the defense. That's, his credibility is, is you know, in question. He has credibility, credibility issues, Without but they do, they've got the goods. They've got it, the well, they, they, they will try to make this a paper case more than a testimony case. So though. explain this to me as someone who's not a legal expert and the people who are watching are not a legal expert. This is what The Hill is reporting. Even legal experts who are broadly unsympathetic toward Trump have misgivings about Bragg's strategy, it says. Uh, for a start, Trump has not been charged with any such election law violations. Secondly, it is not even entirely clear that the classification of payments to Cohen was false. Hush money payments are not illegal. Trump could argue that Cohen was indeed rendering a legal service here. Dina. Well, that is going to be one of the arguments we see. It's going to be, they have to prove intent, and that is going to be their hardest part, that um, Trump somehow directed them intentionally to put it wrong in the ledger and did it in order to intentionally commit another crime. But it's saying hush money payments are not illegal in itself, but this is more about the falsification of documents, is that? Well, it's both because it's just a misdemeanor to falsify a business document. Okay. But in order to raise to the level of a felony, he has to do it with the intent to commit another crime. And the other crime is the campaign violation law. And the timing, he does it 11 days before the November 2016 election. It's the timing of that that's going to be very crucial to the prosecution because you know, if this came out, it was going to hurt his 
election. But we are going to hear from the defense team that this was just personal. This had nothing to do with the election but He, and, and not illegal. This is the key to the case for the prosecution. They are going to try to make this into an election interference case, mm -hmm. not a hush money case. Mm -hmm. the, the, their argument is this money was paid to hide information from the voters on the eve of the 2016 election. It was not to protect Trump's family, his wife, from um, this, this news. It was to deceive the voters. That's what this case is about, according to the prosecution. According to the defense, this is just an attempt to embarrass Donald Trump, to, um, uh, you know, a Democratic prosecutor elected in a Democratic is district is, is, is harassing uh, the possible, even likely, next president of the United States solely for political reasons. That's, that, those are the two core arguments. Typically, it says, uh, the reporting says this is not a misdemeanor, but it can be upgraded, I think, as, as Dina mentioned here, to a felony when records are falsified in an attempt to conceal another crime. Do you think Bragg's team, you think Bragg's team can prove that a felony was committed, Dina? I actually think, again, going back to Michael Cohen, we're going to hear them talk about Michael Cohen because there's these two people um, you know, including the Inquirer a publisher, so I guess you can expand it to three, but they made this deal. They made this arrangement. We are going to help you out by making these payments. And he, um, Michael Cohen did serve time for the campaign violation part. Uh, so the federal government obviously had proved that his part of the involvement was that kind of a crime. So really the prosecution just has to know, show that, that Donald Trump had the awareness, the intent, when he was participating in that arrangement, that he knew that that was going to be also. One very good fact for the prosecution in this case is that there is testimony and evidence that Trump tried to push the payment to Stormy Daniels till after the election, at which point he wasn't going to pay. He said, in essence, let's try to delay this until after the election, and then we don't have to pay her at all. That suggests, if that testimony is believed, that he knew this was all about the election. It had nothing to do with Melania. It was all about deceiving the voters. If that testimony is believed, that Trump tried to work the system to delay the payment so it would not be made at all after the election, that's a bad fact for Does Trump. Stormy Daniels have uh, credibility issues? Because didn't she write a letter because she said she didn't want to um, violate her NDA, in, saying that in, that had no relationship with Donald Trump? In, in 2018, uh, when this story f broke in a, in a very limited way, and Trump wasn't a candidate for, well, no, no. I mean, in, in 2018, she wrote a letter saying she never had sex with him. That um, she has since repudiated. There's lots of evidence that she has told pe told people earlier that they did in fact have sex. Uh, look, I, I, you know, it's it's important to remember that Stormy Daniels was the key witness against Michael Avenatti mm -hmm. in 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 a fraud case that was tried earlier in Manhattan federal court, and the jury believed every word she said. I, I've interviewed Stormy Daniels. I'm kind of an expert on Stormy Daniels. She's a very credible person. Now, it may be that jurors don't like porn stars. It may be jurors don't like people who have interest in paranormal and psychics and ghosts, as, as, as Stormy Daniels does. But Michael Avenatti tried all those things in cross-examining her. He represented himself at that point in the trial. And Stormy Daniels stood up very well under cross-examination. I think she's going to do fine. I think she's a much less problematic witness than Michael Cohen. I think that, I think overall people are, they do find Stormy Daniels um, credible. Her line of work has nothing to do with her credibility, right? But so, um, I, I don't know if you disagree with that, Dina, but I find Stormy Daniels to be credible. Every I have interviewed her, and every time I see her in an interview, I've been, I haven't done a deposition or cross-examined her, but she seems to be a credible witness. I agree. And they'll be able to get out jurors who have really strong opinions about pornography or in their jury questioning that we're going to be seeing this week. That's exactly what the lawyer's aim is to, is to take out people who have strong biases um, on the important, yes, politics is a big thing in this case, but they're going to be asking, how do you feel about infidelity, right? How do you feel about, what kind of businessman are you? Do you own your own business? You know, they're going to be trying to get all of those kind of information from the prospective jurors to make sure there isn't 
somebody who has strong biases or really strong opinions. They cannot set aside and decide the case just based on the facts and the law as presented. It is surreal that we're sitting here talking about a, a, a president sitting in, front, in a criminal trial, a former president, trying to be president again. And then at the same time, let's talk about time and timing. At the same time, uh, his legal team is set to go before the, take the case before the Supreme Court that he is immune to any type of prosecution because he is a president. How is, is that? There are four cases <laughs> against them. I mean, it's so surreal. You can't, I mean, you know, we, again, we, we follow the news closely. This is our job. But think about how bizarre this is. Yeah. And it, this is the middle of the campaign. It, it's, it's April. Now, one thing that's going to be bizarre about this trial is that Judge Mershon, like a lot of judges, has his own schedule, and his schedule is he sits in front of a jury Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. Wednesday, he hears other legal issues. Right. Donald Trump is going to campaign on Wednesdays <laughs> and then come back sitting in court. I mean, who could possibly have imagined is this? Is this going to affect the timing of this? I mean, if the Supreme Court, what if this is still going on and the Supreme Court rules in Donald Trump's favor that, hey, he is immune to prosecution? Uh, well, I, I mean, that, that's a good question. I don't think this trial necessarily would be affected unless they rule in a very specific, very Trump favorable way, which I think is extremely unlikely. But obviously, that's a big factor uh, in, in the, 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 uh, the two federal cases. Uh -huh. I mean, it is entirely possible that if the Supreme Court rules against Trump in favor of the Justice Department, that he could move practically directly from this trial to the one in Washington, which could start in August. Oh my gosh! And 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 you know that could be his entire campaign. But considering the the Comey of all of this, you know the James Comey, what happened with Hillary Clinton, uh, right? It's uh, in August, so close to an election, and he's going to be on trial for all of these things, uh, facing <laughs> facing a judge. Is it possible that they may suspend this until the outcome, until the election happens, Dina? No, because the reason why it's so close to the election is because of his own delays. Ah. Uh, the problem with Comey was that he started an investigation, and I think that was the difference. The FBI rules were like, you're not supposed to start an investigation so close to the election. But the reason why we're in this spot is because Trump has tried to delay his cases so much. And uh, to, yeah, so I, I mean, I hope we do uh, see the D.C. trial, if indeed the Supreme Court rules like we think it will and allows it to go forward because um, n no matter what, with him running or not, you know, he is charged with these really serious crimes and they shouldn't be delayed just because he's on the campaign but, trail. But here's an interesting thing about how Trump has handled all this. Mm -hmm. You know, there have been a lot of pretrial proceedings in, in all four cases. Trump didn't have to go to them. He's gone to basically every single one. He thinks that these cases are working in his favor. He thinks it shows a vendetta. It shows that he's a martyr. And that is the way he has styled his, his re reaction to this, these cases. I don't know if that's going to work. It helps him politically. Well, it, he thinks that. Yeah. yeah but I, and, and again, you know, we're dealing with polls in April, which don't necessarily right. predict the outcome in November. But Trump has embraced these cases as um, part of his campaign instead of trying to push them aside. I'm not sure any of us would have predicted that, and I'm not sure it's the right strategy, but clearly that's what the strategy is. What are you going to be looking for as it relates to this case in Manhattan? What the jurors say in, in voir dire. What, what, how the jurors respond to the questioning uh, from the judge or from the lawyers, and just how much they get into the, jur the jurors' feelings about Donald Trump. And reporters Trump. will be able to report on the, the Correct. questions. That's all. Dina, yeah. what are you going to be looking for? Yeah, I mean, I'm very curious to see what Trump, the criminal defendant, is going to be like in this trial. Because we saw during the E.G. Carroll case, he wasn't that great at controlling himself when she was on the witness stand, during closing arguments, he leaves the courtroom. You know, he's not going to get as much leeway uh, sitting at that table as a criminal defendant as he would as a civil defendant. It's just not going to happen um, because of the seriousness that we treat criminal cases. And can he control himself? Because, you know, to your point, uh, Jeffrey, that he sees this as his campaigning. 
um, him becoming the passive defendant that he should um, and needs to be, honestly, if he's going to be taken seriously by that jury, is so counter to his um, wanting to take a stand and use it politically. And those two forces are going to be at work. And he's got a six-week trial here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what they're estimating. Could go even longer. Is wow. he going to be able to control himself in that courtroom for that long? Um, even listening to some of those answers that the juries are going to give, is he not going to roll his eyes? I'm very curious about how that's going to play out. Six weeks? This is like the, this oh, is going to be, be like the OJ trial. Well, right? <laughs> no, that, was, that was six months, was six so months. yeah. Uh, but uh, listen, I know it's, it's going to be eventually up to the Justice Department and not you guys, but Dina, I'm going to ask you, and this is my last question to you guys, do you think, if, this is a big if, if found guilty, is he, does he serve jail time because it's what, up to four years? Probably not for this case, but as we know, he has a lot more. And if he's convicted here, that can enhance his sentencing if he gets convicted in another one. If he gets convicted in federal court in the January 6th case, definitely go into prison. You think I, so? If this case alone, I think not. How do you put a, a former president in prison? Won't he be compromised just from, I guess he'll figure it out. I, you know, he's, it, he's very easily compromised. He knows a lot of things, and people will be coming for him in prison. Well, I, it's... To say this is an uncharted territory is, is, is an understatement. And um, I, I'm sure the, the Bureau of Prisons will, will try to figure something out. But we are a long way from that step yet. So let, let, let's, let's just see how we get through jury selection in this see, case first. Uh, Dina, I'm, I'm with you. When, you know, remember during the, um, the debates, uh, he may stand up and when someone says something, false. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Contain true. your client. It's true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. All and right. the lawyers and the judge. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. All right, pal. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Gina. We'll see Thanks you soon. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for watching The Don Lemon Show. Make sure you click on the image in the top right to subscribe to my channel and the thumbnail in the bottom right to watch more content from my show. And I'll see you next time.